You're listening to The Wild Initiative Podcast Network. Learn more and check out all the shows at thewildinitiative.com. You're listening to the Fish Untamed podcast, where we talk all things fishing, conservation, and the outdoors. Today on the show, I'm talking to one of my best friends, Melanie Moss. All right, welcome to episode number 12 of the Fish Untamed podcast. Today, I am chatting with one of my very best friends, Melanie Moss who just got back from a month of fly fishing in New Zealand with her husband, Jarrett. So naturally, when I heard that she was going to New Zealand, I wanted to have her come on both to, you know, hear about her experiences, but also to pick her brain a bit about what someone can expect if if they want to do their own trip to New Zealand. Mel did her trip totally DIY, um, and not to take away from anyone wanting to use a guide, but... um, what I learned in this conversation was that it's it's totally doable to go to New Zealand on your own, completely do it yourself, and still catch you know the fish of your life. So the conversation was long enough that uh, I divided it up into two parts. So this is going to be part one. Uh, part two will come out next week. Um, so if you've ever thought about fishing New Zealand, and especially if you've thought about doing it completely do it yourself without the help of a guide, these two episodes are definitely for you. Obviously, everyone's experience is going to be a bit different, so this isn't by any means a a complete how-to guide to do New Zealand, but um, I think the conversation really highlighted some of the major differences between fishing in the U.S. and fishing in New Zealand, so it should give a better idea of, of what to expect if you were to head over there. So, without further ado, here is my chat with Melanie Moss. I wish I had a beer right now. You should go get a beer. Way better. Yeah. At Starbucks, I could just get a 12 pack. It's grocery store. <laughs> just drink them all at your table. <laughs> <laughs> Bud Light number seven. <laughs> that would be so like, much better. You need to just go to Colorado. I'm already having so much fun. <laughs> I know. I honestly was going to tell you, like, when this wasn't working very well, I'm like, maybe it's better that we can't see each other because we're just going to freaking laugh the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I'll, I'll let you start, I guess, because I don't even know where yeah. to start. So, okay. You just go, um, like, you go for it and then I'll ask you things from there. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I guess I just wanted to talk to you first about, like, we haven't, we haven't been able to talk at all about this trip. Um, and I know we wanted to, and I don't even think we really talked before I went on the trip too much. No, because um, I didn't know you were going to the airport. Like I like I like texted you that day, and you right. were heading there. Yeah, um, and I know I know we had talked, you know, a lot further in the past about New Zealand and just kind of I'm going there, I'm going to fish there, and here's what I know about it, you know. Yeah. Um, but it was very brief what we talked about, and I don't think you know I don't even think I ever went into you know why did Jarrett and I pick New Zealand to go to as our, you know, celebration trip. Yeah. So finishing. What else was on the list? Um, it wasn't really that we didn't have a big list of places where we're like, okay, let's narrow this down. Here's pros and cons of going here. It was more of, you know, okay, we have to live apart for a year. Um, we need something to look forward to after I finish physician assistant school, you know, all this stuff. Um, and how long was the gap between when you graduated and when the trip was like, how long were you back together before you left? Um, I graduated August 2nd and then we left October 1st. So we had exactly two months, two months, two months. months. Okay. Yep. And the reason we had that, that gap, uh, we could have gone earlier, but, um, I remember you talking about this in your, one of your previous podcasts that New Zealand has a very strict, Um, trout fishing season. And so when we originally thought about New Zealand, uh, we definitely made sure to look that up and make sure that we were there during fishing season. How long is it? How long is their season? Yeah. Um, So most of the rivers open up October 1st. 
Um, and then they go till about April, I believe it is. Oh, okay. I didn't realize mm-hmm. it was that long. I, I thought it was shorter by the way you said it. Yeah. But, um, you know, if we had gone, let's say for the month of September, most everything would have been closed for fishing, what we wanted to fish. So, oh, okay. you know, we could, we could have gone in September because we had that month off of work, um, and, and school and all that, but we decided, okay, well, I guess we'll book our tickets for October 1st. Cause that's when the fishing season opens. And that's funny. Cause have- I was there in June, I think. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a lot that was closed, but there was also, it just wasn't good. Like there were a couple of places that were open, but so is it not, is not like nationwide regulations? Like some places are open and some are closed. For the majority, uh, it is, it is closed. Um, I think, I think maybe specific lakes might be open all year. Uh, yeah, I could fish a lake. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do that. That was, it just kind of wasn't in our our list of things to do. Um, okay. For, you know, we just, we just more so enjoy fishing rivers and that was kind of what we were aiming for. But, you know, I think the, I think the season, uh, because their spring or their summer is our winter and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So when you were there in their winter, right? It was like late fall. Skiing late hadn't fall. started yet. Yeah. Okay. But I think, cause we got a little booklet when we went and got our fishing licenses at Fish and Game. And it, it was a really nice booklet because then we didn't have to look up. We didn't have phone service over there because we didn't get our SIM cards. And uh, so we were very reliant on this, this actual physical booklet to tell us what rivers we could fish. What we didn't realize is quite a few rivers, most rivers opened October 1st, but quite a few didn't open till November 1st. So we would be talking to these you know, locals and they'd say, oh, you know, this river's good to go to, this river's good to go to. And then we'd look it up in the book and be like, darn, it's not open till November. Um, but that was, that was the minority. The majority were open October 1st. So it wasn't a, that big of an issue. But like I said, we delayed our trip due to the fact that we wanted to mainly go over there for the purpose of fishing. So, so how much did you know about that? Like how much was that involved in the planning and the choosing of New Zealand? over other places? I think we, we chose New Zealand and then we, and then we uh, chose our timeline based on that. Okay. So what else is in the running? Know, uh, nothing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought there was like a list of places you were trying to d- like decide between. Well, here's kind of how we went about deciding on it. Um, you know, we first decided we need a trip. We need a trip. We, let's make it kind of a long trip. We're both gonna be jobless at the time. Um, it's just going to be this perfect time of our lives to go do something like this. Where should we go? Well, then we started talking about what are our main activities? Cause you know, we like to ski, we like to mountain bike, we like to fly fish. Um, but I think, you know, Jarrett just got recently got into fly fishing when he met me. Um, and so he's really, really got that itch still. He's kind of that new, not beginner, I would say, um, you know, when you talked about the phases of fly fishing yeah, on a few of your other podcasts and how there's those people that they're into it, they're getting, they're getting to be really skilled, but they're still really, um, amped up about catching the most fish or the biggest fish or whatever it may be. I think you're like content. It's not like you're just content being out there and right. Exactly. Right. But, um, you know, with that being said, I think that those phases are very relative because when I, New Zealand has that reputation of having huge trophy fish. And I think most people in the fly fishing world know that. Uh, So when we picked New Zealand, I think I reverted back to that phase of, I'm going to go catch the biggest fish in my life. And this is going to be amazing. And I think we mentioned that too. It's like, if you go somewhere with certain expectations for something and then they're not met, you feel like you've lost out, even though that would have been like a great day somewhere else or like in a different situation. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So I think we were both, you know, Jarrett still wants to go catch a bunch of fish, but also big fish. Um, And he's, well, he's really just amped up on fly fishing in general, which I love. Um, And so we were like, okay, I think fly fishing is the activity that we should shoot for when we plan this trip. So now let's pick where we want to go. And 
I don't know. I think it was because we had a couple of friends who had gone uh, recently and they had gone to target, you know, trout and everything. And I think that's just what sparked us to say, wouldn't New Zealand be awesome? Like we know it's scenic, you know, some people, when they're planning a trip, they're like, I want beaches. I want relaxation. I want sunshine. I don't want to have to worry about anything. I'm going to sit on the beach all day. And we were like, okay, we just lived in Arizona and California. We don't really need the whole, that. the whole West is a beach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but at the same time, New Zealand's cool. Cause it's got, it does have beaches. It does have mountains. It does have skiing, um, fly fishing, mountain biking. It kind of has it all. So we were like, you know what? New Zealand sounds perfect. And I hate to say it, but a big factor is we haven't really gone on any international trips together. And a big factor is that it's an English speaking country. Yeah, um, for sure. Him and I both are not fluent in either language, which I feel terrible about. Um, but I thought this would be a perfect trip for us to kind of, you know, travel together for a long period and um, be somewhere new and, and experience this a different culture, but not too different to where we're completely overwhelmed. Okay. So what was the, what was like, once you decided, what could you plan before you went? Like when you, when you were picking, you know, where you wanted to go and rivers you wanted to fish, like what resources were you using for that? Uh, good question. So <laughs> preparation for this trip was not, was not all that it could have been. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was a PA student and Jarrett was working six or seven days a week prior to, prior to the two months that we had. And in between, you know, me graduating, graduating and then going on the trip, we had so many things going on that we really didn't sit down and say, okay, here's the map. Where are we going? You know, let's read, let's read these articles on what rivers we should go to or this or that. Um, it was more so <laughs> I bought him a DVD called Trout Bomb Diaries, <laughs> Huey Camo, and I said, watch this. <laughs> I don't have time right now, but I think you should watch this and tell me what we need to know about New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you find a DVD? <laughs> <laughs> I got it at Barnes & Noble, and I was like, here's one of your birthday presents. <laughs> and I think he said he fell asleep during it. Um <laughs> But he did get some information out of it. He told me, okay, based on this DVD, fly fishing in New Zealand is going to be extremely rewarding. We're going to catch big fish, but it's going to be frustrating as heck. <laughs> <laughs> That's about what he learned. And, uh, and so there was that. And then we also, as the trip got closer, um, you know, we would read online here and there, like, about gear that we should bring or, um, you know, some fishing regulations about the rubber sole boots that we needed to get versus not, you know, not bringing felt boots over, uh, things are like felt that. Are felt boots but, illegal or are they just like mm, not recommended? Yeah. So really good question. And I kind of had to research into that. And I was like, some websites were saying, uh, they're completely illegal. And some were saying they're just frowned upon. But then I went to their fish and game website and I don't know when the, uh, the FAQ section was, was written for about that, but basically they were saying, we don't, we don't tell people not to bring their felt sole boots over, uh, or their gear. I think it's different. It must be different for hunting versus fishing too. Oh, hunting different game. I'm not, I'm not sure actually, but what I took away from it is that just don't bring them. Because <laughs> you have to go through, you have to go through a biosecurity. Um, just easier not uh, to. Yeah, exactly. During the the airport thing, which is a whole, that's a different experience in and of itself. Because um, when we got to Auckland, we we were pretty sh short on time to get to our next connecting flight to go into Christchurch, and they were like, "Okay, you got to bring all your gear through biosecurity." And you have to declare all of your camping gear, all of your hiking gear, all of your fishing gear, and, you know, say, is it new? Is it used? Has it recently been out in the mud or, you know, out hiking with your hiking boots? 
And so that was interesting because we had all our bags packed so meticulously with all of our gear and we brought a, we brought a tent over in case we went back country. Um, and they said, you got to bring your, you got to get your tent out. We got to inspect it. Um, get your waiters out. I actually brought new waiters over, um, because I had a pair, I had a pair from I think a year ago or, or more that I bought, but my Patagonia ones are still working fine. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to keep these in case something goes awry with the other pair. Um, and it ended up being perfect because they were brand new to bring to New Zealand. So I just, I was able to tell them at biosecurity that oh, that's nice. I had new, new waiters. Yeah. And my boots were also new. Um, I got these, this really cheap pair on Amazon of rubber soled boots because I was like, you know what? It's just for the month. I have my nice boots back at home. I ended up loving them. <laughs> they were well, like $30. Good. And super lightweight. Well, what way are they? lightweight. I, I kind of want some then. <laughs> They're frog togs. <laughs> <laughs> um, try them out. Right. They did not. Okay. And so Jarrett got some new ones too. Cause he, once again, we, we both needed rubber soled boots. We just didn't want to mess with it. Whether, you know, they were to confiscate them or not. Right. There's some or states just clean too. Them. Like there's some yeah, states that you it, need them for. So I might as well have a pair. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, he got some really nice Cabela's ones, um, you know, triple to quadruple the price of mine and his, uh, came apart when we were over there oh, and I'm geez. like, ha ha, my frog dogs are still <laughs> intact. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> yeah. So, and they're super lightweight, which was really nice. Um, that's another thing about, about New Zealand fly fishing is you hike a lot. And I remember listening to your podcast with Jay Scott. Uh -huh. And he was saying, you know, you'll, you'll hike along and, and this is kind of going off on a tangent. We can talk about this later, um, about, you know, what, what is to be entailed with, uh, New Zealand fly fishing in general, but basically, yeah, you, you hike a long time. Like we would hike along this river for miles so before why? even saying, uh, so it sounds like you're not hiking to like two, it's like you're hiking to a lake that just happens to be five miles away from the nearest trail right uh right you're walking along a river so like what stops you from fishing the river just where you start yeah that's a good that's a really good question um i'll give you a one river an example that i'll kind of describe for you and the and the hiking trail that's along it and kind of why why you'll do that so you probably know this uh new zealand fly fishing is it's really well known for its sight fishing um, so the water, you know, that's, that's one of the things you hear about. I think you hear maybe two or three different things when you hear about New Zealand fly fishing. One, the trout are huge. <laughs> You're pretty much going to go over there and catch some, a couple fish of a lifetime. Two, um, the water is incredibly clear and you're going to be doing a lot of sight casting. Three, the wind is atrocious. Really? I, I haven't is, heard that one. You haven't? <laughs> no, oh, okay. I don't think so. I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but I had days where I, I would throw my rod. I'd just throw my rod down and be like, I'm done with this wind. I can't even handle it. I've never, I've never casted in heavier winds than over really? New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it being windy. Yeah. But I also wasn't fishing, so I could have easily just not noticed. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. That's one element when you're fly fishing that you really don't want to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you really notice it immediately. Yeah. But, uh, so we were at this river and it was, it was crystal clear. So, you know, we, we would ask a lot of locals and people at fly shops and things like, do you fish, do you blind fish? They call it blind fishing, which is basically our form of fishing, right? Like we don't, not, we don't not sight, sight casting. Yeah. We don't over in the States. It's rare that I sight fish, maybe a few places that we go in Colorado, but and they're usually small. Um, I feel like I can see them in like small creeks, but I'm not spotting giant fish generally in right. larger rivers. Right. Yeah. So, you know, they said, no, honestly, we don't fish the water unless you can see a fish because there might be only one fish per, you know, quarter to half a mile of river. How? Like, it's how just, does that, how does that even sustain itself? Is it one big fish or just one, one fish? One big fish. One big okay. fish. Okay. So yeah. they just don't want to catch the smaller fish. Yeah, I think so. I, I don't know though. Cause you know, you'd walk along a river and think, okay, there should be a fish in there based on my knowledge of, 
of good fishing water and I can see into that run, but for some reason I can't see any fish. And maybe, I mean, I don't think I was extremely good at spotting the fish. I think maybe the people, the locals fish over there, they can see, they're just really good at it. They have an eye for it, right? Cause they've done it all their lives or as long as they've been fishing. So do you um, think there would be fish in that pool that just were too small for you to see? Could have been, could have been. But you just but like wouldn't the, fish them. Right. But at the same time, um, you know, fishing over there, even when we were blind fishing, cause we did, we did do a, a fair amount of blind fishing cause it was their springtime. So it was their runoff. So some of the rivers that, you know, in the summertime would be crystal clear sight fishing waters were more a little bit milky to where we could fish how we fish back home. Did our, you catch anything you know, during that? That's honestly, Katie, that's where we, that's how we caught most of our fish. So people just need to do that. <laughs> exactly. Like suck it up and, and blind fish. Yeah. And I think, you know, what was interesting is we went in to talk to this, um, this gal at a fly shop in one of these small towns. And, you know, she seemed like a very seasoned local lady angler. Um, she had, it seemed like she had a lot of knowledge about the area. She'd been doing it for a long, long time. And that was one of the gals that we asked you know, do you only fish for the fish that you can see? And she said, yep, I, it's basically hunting. I only cast a fish I can see. And, um, I don't know. It just seemed, it just seemed like that was the trend over there, but it was interesting. Cause we asked her, this was maybe a week into our trip or so. And we had been, we had a few frustrating days, uh, prior to talking to her. So we were kind of, you know, going into it, like, feeling a little defeated when we went in to have this conversation with her and we're like what what do we need to do here to succeed and she I loved her response because it was honestly like do what you do best she said one person's setup and rig can be another person's she called it rubbish because they call rub, trash rubbish over there <laughs> so she's like one person could th think that you know this is this is completely rubbish setup. The other person could think this is the best thing in the world and they'll go out and they'll catch fish on it because that's what they know to do. So do what you know how to do best. And I loved that. I loved that response because I asked her, you know, do we need to be using these crazy long leaders that, you know, everyone in New Zealand says, yep, you know, 12 to 15 foot leaders better get used to casting those. She said, no, you don't need to. If you're going to be nymphing, Use what you'd use at home. If you can, you know, if you know the depth of that pool that you're going to be nymphing in, your leader doesn't have to be 15 feet long. So I really liked her advice because we, you know, we were like, ah, should we use these New Zealand indicators? We bought some. They're basically wool, um, mm -hmm. little tufts of wool. And they're supposed to, you know, set on the water very nicely and not spook any fish. And, and granted, we had a few... We had a few rivers where that would have been the way to go. We, we bought them our very first day in New Zealand and we lost them somewhere in our van until the very last day. Oh, so, <laughs> so, so no New just, Zealand indicators for you. Right. So we were like, you know what, let's just go, let's just do what we do best and we'll use the indicators we use at home and it worked. That's how we caught the most, the majority of our fish. So I would say, you know, for anyone that, wants to go to New Zealand, but thinks that it's this whole new ball game. You can catch fish on streamers. If that's what you like best, you can catch fish nymphing with a little bubble indicator. If that's what you like best, or you can catch fish on dry flies. And did you see uh, any fish rising? Did you fish yeah, the dry flies? We did. We did. Um, you know, it was, it was the beginning of their season and every fly shop that we went into, we would ask, you know, what's the best, best method uh, to fish at this point, And they were like nymphing, hands down nymphing. And we're like, good. Cause we're good at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but we did have a couple of, uh, really cool dry fly experiences. Uh, one of them, we were at a campground and Jarrett was sleeping in the, he was napping in the van. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go explore this little, uh, it was a pretty small stream near the campground, but really crystal clear waters. And, uh, 
I saw a fish. I walked it quite a ways before I saw a fish, but then I did see a fish um, take take a uh, fly off the surface. And then I saw, a, so then a, that fish actually spooked away because I'm, as much as you, well, this is, this is a different part of the conversation, but the frustrations of trying to uh, be sneaky on these fish is, is outrageous. But um, I spooked that fish away, but I saw another one right way across the river, um, kind of just working a little run. It, it wasn't rising, but I was like, I wonder if I can get this fish to eat off the surface because it was a pretty shallow run. And so I stayed behind it and um, cast a elk hair caddis at it. And I think it was my second cast, it came up and hit it. And I was like, no way, you know when you get a fish on a dry and you have it on before you realize that it actually hit? You like are fighting the fish before you actually realize like, oh my gosh, that was crazy. It just happened so quickly. <laughs> yeah. There's always a part so of me when I set cool. the hook too on a dry that I'm kind of expecting the fish not to still be on it when I finish setting the hook. Because like right. half the time, you know, the dry fly just flies right out and you got to try again. So right, whenever I right, pull right. it and the fish is actually there and it's still there two or three seconds later, I'm like, wow. This is a moment of shock. <laughs> I went really, yeah, it went really smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think, you know, in that situation, had I not hooked that fish, I don't, I don't know if I would have had another chance at it, but we did have a really awesome, uh, hatch one night. We were fishing this river and this is another kind of interesting part of New Zealand, uh, is there's a couple rivers that are designated as fly fishing only. So you can't come and spin fish on it. It, it was actually really, really a special experience because there was, you know, for us, because we fly fish, we're like, cool. <laughs> Nobody else but fly fishermen are allowed on this. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I guess if you spin fish, you'd be like, what the heck? But uh, yeah, it was, it was a super cool experience. It was on the North Island and it was very, um, very secluded, very out in the middle of nowhere, beautiful scenery around. And uh, we had an epic day on this river. And we decided to stay out there because we weren't sure if we were going to move on and go to a new spot or stay out there for a night because we had the van, which was really awesome. Yeah, I want to hear about the van too, like separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll talk about that and just kind of how that gave us such freedom and flexibility um, with our the planning while we were over there. But anyway, we decided, yeah, let's stay out here. It was such an awesome day. Let's do it again tomorrow. Um, and there was a fish, a fishing, an angler access that also said, you know, self-contained campers are welcome to camp here. And nobody was out there. It was gorgeous, right on the river. Um, and we had an epic hatch that night. It was amazing. I threw on, I think I could have thrown on, it, it was a mayfly hatch uh, for the most part, primarily, but I think I could have thrown on pretty much any dry fly and they would have gone after it. And it was so cool because it was you know all the way across the river so it really tested our casting uh mm -hmm. skills and i had to stand we weren't sure the river was a little murky still so we weren't sure how deep it was to to get closer to the run mm -hmm. um so you know we kind of had to help each other get out into the middle of the river and then there was this one rock we could stand on and uh get ourselves up above more but it was such a rush i can't even i mean you know the rush of dry fly fishing where you're like seeing these huge fish just roll and their backs and just, you know, there's a ton of them in there and you can throw probably, you know, any of the staple dry flies that we carry mm -hmm. in our box and it's going to work. And I was like, yep, you know, BWO, here we go. <laughs> and it, they just smashed it. But, but it was awesome. It was fun because it, just the action of it, you know, I would fish it and then Jarrett would, and, um, we would, we would switch off, but, um, it was, it was just so fun. Cause we were loud. We were, we were yelling, like hooping and hollering and, you know, Oh, that one, you know, you'd have, you'd get a strike, but then you'd obviously miss it. And, you know, it's like every, maybe every five strikes you'll actually, hook in one. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was just super fun. But so, how big are these fish? Are like all the fish you catching, you know, really huge? Or are there some like ten inchers thrown in? 
Good question. Um, there were, so New Zealand kind of, you know, when you go to a river and you know that there's just big fish and then you catch and you catch a, what would be a really nice fish elsewhere. I'm but all of a sudden reef. you're like, yes, that is, that's a very good example. You're like, oh, um, all the other ones were 24 inches and this one's only 18. Yeah. Yeah. This one doesn't even deserve to get its picture taken. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were for the majority it's interesting because we got our mindset into pounds over there because they don't talk about their fish in terms of inches. They talk about them in terms of pounds. How do you measure that? Honestly, I think it's a uh, experience over time because we would ask people, we would ask locals, like we'd show them a picture of a fish that we caught and they'd say, yeah, that looks to be, oh, that's for sure about four to, that's four pounds or that's five pounds. And I'm like, hmm, I, I'm not sure how you know that, but I can't awesome. even guess length from pictures. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, we didn't have our tape measure either, so we couldn't measure length. But yeah, the majority of fish we were catching were were 16, 18, 20. I mean, it was it was outrageous. Like they were if you caught a 10-inch, 12-inch fish, which we I probably caught maybe less than 5. Less than 5 fish that were in that size category. And when you did, you were almost shocked and it's like I hate I hate the way I'm feeling about this this beautiful fish oh, right now. Oh, I know. It's... I have the same problem where I'm like, this fish. And then I'm like, that's so mean. Right, <laughs> like, this, right. This fish isn't any worse. It's just exactly, younger. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, go grow bigger. <laughs> Put you back and grow bigger. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, New Zealand definitely. I remember um, a friend of ours seeing one of the pictures of some of the fish we caught. And uh, he's like, uh, yeah, when you come home, you're getting very spoiled right now. And when you come home, fishing's kind of going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the fish were just, they were beautiful. That, that river that I was just describing, um, the is, is actually the river in New Zealand. That's the, that's like world renowned for the most hard, uh, fighting fish ever. Oh, really? So yeah. is this all on the South Island? Cause you went to the North Island too, right? We did. We covered, uh, both islands pretty well. Um, when we planned this trip, we had originally just planned for the South Island uh, because we had about, the timeline of the trip was about five weeks, a little bit less. So we, we usually just said, okay, we've got a month over there. Mm -hmm. um, what can we cover in that time? And the way that we, I kind of skipped over how we went about planning which rivers to go to. Yeah. Um, so I have, we'll go back to that. So I have a, a good friend, um, who I met in Colorado and what's, what's fun about it is when I was guiding over there, he came out to visit. He was a friend of a friend and I brought him fly fishing for his very first time ever out in Colorado. And now he, he went to New Zealand actually last year and the majority of his time was spent fly fishing and he absolutely just loves it. Um, so it was pretty cool because he gave me most of the advice of what rivers to go over there. That's to nice. go to. Yeah. That's a so big was, step up, like having a place to go, at least like the starting point. Yeah, exactly. Cause otherwise we were like, you know what, we're going to have to get a guide maybe, uh, the first day or couple days that we fish so that we can, a, get to know the techniques over there and B, uh, you know, pick their brain about other places to go. And I feel like they'll, you know, be more willing if we go out on a trip with them. Right. So that was like the big debate in our heads was to get a guide or not to get a guide. Um, and we, once we got this information, so shout out to my friend Shane, if he ever listens to this, um, hey Shane. because he, <laughs> he basically made our trip happen for us. Uh, he wrote out probably, I think three pages of just on, uh, Microsoft word. He just typed up this big, long, um, New Zealand fishing tips and places to go document for us. So it was super awesome. He started, he kind of broke it up into North Island and South Island rivers. Um, and just his experiences. Cause I know he went out with a couple of guides over there. Um, and so I'm assuming they gave him suggestions as well. So it was basically, we kind of 
through the grapevine got some information from guides over there. Um, but at the same time, we had been emailing guides before our trip to kind of get, you know, prices and where do they guide and do they have openings and things like that? What, you know, what do they focus on? Because we weren't sure. We, we were trying to do this trip on a budget. Um, so we just weren't sure if that's where we wanted to spend our money or if we wanted to do more DIY the whole entire time. Um, and this document that we got from my friend, it just, it made our trip happen. It was so awesome. He, you know, not only just wrote down what rivers to try, but he would say, here's where I accessed it. Um, this river was really difficult to wade through or wade around, um, the bush, they call they don't call it brush or forest over there. They call it the bush. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, the bush is really thick in this one. It's overgrown. Um, but it's a gem of a river. You got to try it. Or, you know, he'd say this river, um, make sure you make sure you hike up quite a ways. Cause that's where the big Browns like skip the first few pools. That's what gets fish the most, which for the most part, you know, when, where you park, you're going to know that those first mm. few pools get pressured the most, but, but yeah, so that's kind of how we went about it. And then, um, because we didn't have the use of our phones, uh, to use maps, I actually, he also told me about this really cool app called, uh, maps me or maps dot me. And what you can do is do you, have you heard of that one, that app I don't before? I think so. Okay. So it was, it was a lifesaver. Um, we, we got around the island solely based on that app. Um, what you can do is you download it, you download it. And then before you go somewhere, when you have, you know, Wi-Fi or service, mm -hmm. you download a country and then you get their offline map. Um, so we had New Ze we had all of New Zealand and you'll zoom in and you'll see, you'll see pretty detailed, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of details like street names. You'll see some stores if you zoom in far enough on little towns and things like that. So, and actually halfway through the trip, we realized that that app, you can actually type in a, uh, you know, point A to B and it'll give you directions just like oh, really? Google maps would. Yeah. Offline though, which is really cool, but we didn't have that for the first half. So for the first half of the trip, cause we just didn't know, we didn't know how to use that app very well. First part of the trip, I would just, um, track us because you can see the little blue dot you know mm -hmm. where we're via satellite where we are and then I would just tell Jarrett okay turn left here I think we can get to the river from here it's a public road yep let's go so it was really a lot of um a lot of information compiled between getting it from local fly shops you know and they they would talk so fast too over there I'm like can we slow down and write that down because I did not hear any of the three names of the roads that you just told us to turn on. Um, but you know, for the most part, we did go based off of Shane's document that he gave us. And then I would just find the river. Um, I'd either find it on my Atlas where I could kind of lay it out and see a bigger blown up version of the, of the country. And then I could say, okay, it's in the, you know, Southwest region of the South Island. And then I could kind of zoom in on my app and find it better and find roads that I, we could access it on. So how did you find out where it was like private land? Cause I feel like that's a big problem here. Um, mm -hmm, you're oh, right. And you it. said you, you use that app on it that tells you, right? Right. Yep. But I wasn't sure. Which I haven't gotten have... into yet. Oh, okay. Well, I don't think they have like foreign countries anyway, but, um, like, right. It's just not an issue because um, you knew that you, like you had the recommendation of that river. So like you were already familiar with the fact that you could access it or were there places that it was sketchy and you couldn't access? Yeah. Um, there was one river, uh, so this is just an example, but you know, in Shane's document, he said, this river, you have to go here. And it was actually one of the ones that's the fly fishing only river. Um, but he was like, uh, unfortunately not a lot of access, public access, but there are places. So you just have to search them out. Um, and we, <laughs> this was actually really interesting. We went to that river and we started fishing by this bridge. And 
you know, there, so we looked a lot of times for angler access signs and that was a big tip off for us to be like, yep, this is a public area. This is good. Um, because when you're out there, you know, it's not like, it's not like there's a lot of pull-offs like I picture when we go fly fishing in the states along a river and it's like oh there's a car and they're fishing so this is totally a public access point Mm -hmm. it's like you you're pretty much the only people out on that river which is super awesome you rarely see other people unless it's unless it's in like the Taupo region which is in the north island um and it's like a very it's a world-renowned fly fishing destination um this this river called the Tongariro River but other than that, if you're going out into the more uh, rural areas, you're you're probably not going to see any other anglers. And if you so, do, yeah, so I was wondering about that. So it sounds like it's a pretty popular place for people to travel. But is mm-hmm. it just that it's popular for people to travel to, but still, like in the grand scheme, there's not that many people that actually are going there. Or is it because it was early in the season? Are there locals that I, are fishing it? I think it's uh, it's a combination of of all those that you just said but I think one of the main reasons was it was early season okay and I think I think had we gone in say December um which is getting to get into their summer uh it would have been a lot more pressured we probably would have seen a lot more people um I remember coming out from our backcountry hut trip which is the main reason we went back there was to fish this uh, this backcountry river and uh, we saw some people, a young couple ha- had all their fishing gear and they were about to hike in. And they said, how many people did you see back there fishing? Cause we chatted with them for a little bit and we said, not, no one else was out there. And they're like, oh good. Okay. Cause that's, you know, honestly, if anyone else is fishing that river, it's kind of, it's kind of not worth going back there. If it's oh, been, really? if, if you're going to be fishing the same, yeah, because you, that was one of the rivers where you walk, you walk like maybe a half a mile, see a pool, see a fish, spook it away if you're Jarrett and Melanie Moss. And then, uh, <laughs> and then have to hike to the next pool. So. I just picture you going for like a month of just like, whoop, there goes another one. <laughs> Just so like, we never get we have anything. a phrase. We have a phrase called um, "We just were like, oh, there's another heartbreak fish, basically." <laughs> and we just we know what that means to, with each other. We're just like heartbreak fish, and it's just like it's just it was an unspoken thing eventually between us where we were just like looked at each other and we're just like another one bites the dust. There we go. (laughs) It was frustrating, but at the same time, like, you know, the, that was the best, one of the best fly fishing trips of our lives. It was, it was all the feels and so many emotions. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but, but I want to go back to really quick about this public access thing. Uh, so we were fishing that river and that we, we started at this bridge and there was an angler access, uh, sign. So we started fishing and, you know, within, within maybe five minutes, we were hooked. We had hooked into three, two, three fish by then. Um, so we we're like, Whoa, this, this river is fire. Um, and we were having a blast, definitely losing so many more fish than, than we were netting. And that was kind of the theme of, of New Zealand. <laughs> uh, Speaking fish, so when you do fish. get one in, yeah, it was a lot of fishing and some catching. <laughs> that's, that's why they call it fishing. <laughs> <laughs> so cliche, Katie. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we got there and, um, and we were fishing and we had a fish in the net and all of a sudden this guy came out of nowhere. I have no idea where he came from. It's this older guy and totally like this local dude that just goes around and fly fishes like the, the tweed and, uh, cig- and cigar type of guy or okay. pipe smoking guy that you were talking about in your previous podcast. <laughs> um, still keeping it alive over there. Totally. Yeah. And he, and he chatted with us and, you know, I think he was just happy to see us. Honestly, he sat on the, on the bank and just watched us catch fish. And I was kind of like, this is a little strange, but at the same time, um, I could tell he was that type of guy that was like, I've had my fair share of catching New Zealand fish. And I just like love watching these Americans who are all stoked up on it. 
catching the biggest fish of their <laughs> lives, quote unquote. Whereas for me, it's just, you know, whatever, another fish. Um, so, so yeah, he, he started talking to us and he goes, Oh, by the way, uh, you didn't cross over this bridge, did you? And we go, no, but we kind of wanted to, cause you know, the run, the access to this run from the other side of the river looks really good. And he goes, yeah, I wouldn't go over there. And we're like, why? He goes, um, the guy that owns that property right there, he's probably watching us right now. And he's known to shoot at people. Oh, I'm like, geez. Oh, that doesn't yeah. seem very New Zealand of him. No, not at all. For them. I mean, really for the most part, the, the Kiwis were very, very hospitable, very nice. Um, always stopping to ask if we were okay. Cause we were, you know, a lot of times out in the middle of nowhere and uh, just making sure we didn't need any help because our van stuck out like a sore thumb. It was, it had a oh, dragon. Yeah, so tell me about it. the, it's time for the van. It's time for, what was time for Daryl, the daring dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the reason, right, continue. <laughs> uh, the reason it was daring was because it went to a lot of places that nobody else would probably go <laughs> in their little tourist van, but it was, it was, uh, it was quite the sight. We rented from escape camper vans. There Did are, you both are, drive? We both drove. Okay. Driving over there was a trip. It, uh, you know, when we first picked up our van in Christchurch, we were in this busy city and we had to drive on the left side of the road. And we had the driver's seat on the, you know, where our passenger seats are in the, in the States. And we freaked out for a hot second. It was like, you know, I think I just need to stop and collect my cool because I am, <laughs> this is crazy. Um, I found that the seat on the wrong side of the car was like, it didn't take that long to get over that. Occasionally mm-hmm. I turn the wipers on when I meant to do like a turn signal or something. I still do that now that I'm in the States again. Oh, really? Yep. You've backed, you've switched. <laughs> I found that only took a couple couple times of driving to get used to, but yeah, driving on the other side of the road was a lot more stressful because you're used to things like I can turn right on red and it's left, correct? On, you know, it's yep. the opposite. And I definitely like cut across. I cut people off over there because I was like, oh, I can do this safely. And I would just like cut across traffic by accident. Yep. And I was like, please give me the grace of being a tourist because you can tell my van is not a local van. <laughs> <laughs> or you're really local. Your family's been living there for generations. <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't care anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'll cut people off if I want to. Uh, yeah, I always found myself hugging the um, the shoulder a little bit because I was like, this is just yeah, too just weird. I, yeah, I don't know how close I am to the center. It just feels odd. Um, but anyway, so Daryl, the daring dragon, he, uh, he was a very trustworthy home on wheels for about a month. Um, But he was painted like a dragon. Like that's why he's called. Yeah. So escape. Yeah. So escape camper vans is the company we went through. Um, and they were great. Uh, so, you know, I would recommend them if anyone wants to go over there, but there are a lot of van, van companies over there. Um, we just had researched this one and thought, okay, they've got pretty good reviews and they're uh, kind of medium middle road price, price line. So we thought, why not give it a shot? <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, all their vans are uh, painted very very in a very unique style and they're all different. So they have the artists come in and you know one van will have let's say the cute or the the kiwi all over it you know the local kiwi bird all over it or ours had the big dragon on the side um they would have one of them was like winnie the pooh characters it was it was wild you would and then you can't choose either so you you show up and you get what you get and it's like okay we could either get a really cool design or one that we're like pretty embarrassed to drive around <laughs> for a month uh like winnie the pooh <laughs> I wish you had gotten we ended, the <laughs> we ended up getting Daryl. We named him Daryl. Um, but at first we were like, darn, I wish there was like a really big brown trout on the side of our van or something really cool like that. Instead, we get this dragon. And by day, so we drove it around Christchurch and we're like, everybody's looking at us. I know it. I know it. Everybody's staring. <laughs> 
Uh, and by day two or three, we were pretty proud to have Daryl because we could, we would see other escape vans around and we're like, oh, okay. Ooh, I like ours better than that one. <laughs> also, there's that many around people are probably used to seeing them. So it's not nearly as weird. They're not like, Oh my God, look at that dragon. Like they right. don't know what it is. <laughs> Which we didn't really realize either, but camper van life in New Zealand is huge. Um, I remember that. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I just remember when I was going to, and I ended up getting out of this because, so this makes sense for you guys to have a van because mm-hmm. you were driving around, um, sleeping in it for like a month. Yeah. When I was there, it was for like nine days. And when I went to rent online before I went there, the cheapest option was a van. And I was like, I have a company, like I was taking Airbnbs there. Right. So I was like, I don't really need or want a van. It's just me. I've got one bag and I've got places to sleep. Like this just seems like a hassle to drive around on the wrong side of the road. Yeah. When I got to the rental place, they had an extra car and they let me take it. So I skipped out of the van. Okay. But I do remember seeing a lot of vans and that's like what they had pushed at the start when I went to rent. They were like, get this van. It right. Just like everyone was driving vans. <laughs> yeah. Cause New Zealand is, you know, for the, a lot of the majority of their economy is run off tourism. So. Oh yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. So, uh, so van life, van life was really cool. We actually, uh, didn't really get sick of each other. We didn't get sick that's, of it. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask too. Cause I could see, <laughs> like, I'd be like, Mike, we need to take a break after like a week. <laughs> yeah. Let's just go get it. I'll get my own hotel room. You get your own, like, <laughs> but you didn't get sick of each other. It went well. It went really, really well. Um, spring, in New Zealand, the weather was very unpredictable. So we would get, you know, sometimes three to four days in a row of rain. And we're like, you know what? I'm kind of sick of van life right now. Nothing dries out. It's always damp. Um, you just, you don't have that inside space really to air things out. So Uh that got a little, that was the only thing that got old, but I loved the flexibility of being able to say, you know, we thought we'd stay at this river for two days, but it really didn't fish the way we wanted it to this day. So let's go to this next one. Um, or, Hey, let's stay here another night. This was amazing. And we want to do it again tomorrow. That's like Um, my favorite thing, having that kind of flexibility on a trip. Like I love planning, but I love when you have so much time in a place that you can just like guilt free, be like, let's just stay here another night. It's so nice to not feel like you are being pulled away from somewhere you want to stay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was the way, um, that was the way to plan that trip for sure was not planning it too much. Mm -hmm. And I think you, like when you and I go on trips together, we do, we have a very good balance of that. Like we have places we definitely want to hit, but how we get from place to place and when we get each place is kind of left up in the air. It's just, yeah, I agree. So did you have, I assume every once in a while you did sleep in like an actual building, like to get showers and stuff. Um, we slept in our van all but one night, which is when we went. Yeah. So the only night we didn't sleep in the van was, uh, the backcountry hut. All right. And that's a wrap on part one. Next week will be the second half of this episode on New Zealand. And you can get that by going over to the Wild Initiative podcast and subscribing there. You'll also get all of Sam's other shows throughout the week. And you can find my episodes on fishandtame.com in addition to weekly backcountry fly fishing articles. And you can find me on social media on Instagram at fishuntamed or under my name, Katie Bergert on Go Wild. And I will see you same time, same place next week.